Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so at Digitalisation in Deutschland, we yeah, looked into Capella about two years ago, or started looking into it, and we realized it's a great match for our needs. So yeah, I'd like to share with you how our engineering environment around it has evolved since then and how it looks like today. Um, yeah, but first, before we dive into it, I'd like to introduce our uh, sector initiative. So, Digitalisierung in Deutschland is an initiative led by Deutsche Bahn. It aims to address some of the key expectations towards the rail of the near future. Uh, well, we believe that society expects German railways to double the amount of passengers by 2030, while decreasing CO2 emissions and improving punctuality significantly. And uh, while looking at those targets, we also came to the conclusion that physical expansion as in building more tracks is not a solution anymore, and we need to innovate within the existing network. Um, that's the only chance to get more traffic into railway. So um, yeah, in the first stage, the initiative looks into the implementation of European train control system like DCS technology. But uh, next to it, the second stage will build on top to improve performance, quality, and efficiency of railway system uh, by adding degrees of automation in traffic management, in train driving, and infrastructure operation. Yeah, and um, we'd like to do what, uh, well, to do that with uh, some really new technologies. We think there is no way uh, without those. So we're looking into artificial intelligence for traffic and incident management, uh, cloud computing and 5G connectivity, localization and perception technologies. Um, yeah, and digitalizing the railway system also requires new models of partnership between operators and industry. Um, we basically need to quickly validate our requirements and technological assumptions um, in collaboration. Uh, projects with industrial partners. Um, same time, we also need to achieve standardization and harmonization at European level with other rail operators. Um, yeah, so basically turning from a consumer of closed systems, we'd like to evolve into the active co-developer of open platforms. And you can learn more about our organization and what we do uh, by following that link here or scanning the QR. Um, yeah, now let's look at our systems engineering challenges. So why do we model? Um, yeah, to modernize and digitalize something as complex as, well, the real system, railway system itself, uh, we need to understand really well the surrounding actors and operational processes and workflows within the system, functions and, and, and responsibilities. And um, our Arcadia method came really uh, nicely <laughs> in uh, for the challenge. Um, we also need to test the concepts we come up with um, and basically collect the valid concepts in our reference architecture. Um, the reference architecture is being developed um, following a pretty detailed process that builds on top of Arcadia, but also uh, it's some domain specific flavor from the regulations and guidelines that we have. Yeah, and uh, this is roughly how our first challenge looks like. Uh, to settle on the look of the rail of the future, we need to co-work actively with, with our um, external partners, with basically other EU rail operators, to you know have a joint and common understanding of certain things. So we have a need for uh, collaboration areas or collaboration models where things could evolve. Um, but at the same time, there are also quite a few features and functions that are specific to um, Germany for now, or maybe other partners did not go there yet. So um, those are developed within our reference architecture and let's say frequently synchronized. On the other hand, when we come up with some 
ideas about or concept concepts for the uh, reference architecture of the digital rail, uh, we also need to validate those. And uh, in many cases, we go straight into simulations with Simulink and uh, some more complex um, simulation engines that, yeah, maybe 3D um, with physics and photorealistic elements. Um, but we cannot simulate everything, so we also uh, do sometimes proof of concept or demonstration uh, demonstrator projects. Um, we also use those to acquire actual field data. And uh, of course, I mean it's uh, an initiative that works with others, and uh, others um, sometimes still use SysML, so we also need to have interface to that community. So the um, one, one of the first challenges we hit was how to um, yeah, make this external collaboration really work for uh, people who are outside of our organization that have their own IT security constraints. Um, at the same time, I mean, it wasn't a great solution for us as pace of modeling needs to be fast, basically run multiple workshops at the same time, and there is no time for merge conflict resolution. And it's a pretty big team, it's a pretty big distributed team, so a classical way of adding or removing people uh, to and from uh, models uh, doesn't really work for us, so we had to come up with a self-service access management system so that basically architects or model owners could invite um, people into the model directly. Right, so uh, this is what we came up with um, as a solution to our collaboration challenge. We went into Team for Capella <laughs> for quite some time, and um, we tried to build on top of Team for Capella a bit of a management environment to um, basically stream it to the browser as a web application uh, for our external partners, so they don't need basically to be on our VPNs or install any special software. Um, yeah, model owners can grant access uh, or delegate access management to other users from the outside, so uh, this can be coordinated locally by the teams. And we also create uh, read-only users because not everybody is like allowed or expected to model uh, or modify models there, but maybe just to review it. So also the license consumption is somewhat reasonable. Yeah, and here I can quickly switch over to, well, sorry, to a demo of that thing. Um, this is how the management interface looks like. So here I basically able to create new users, grant them access, request a session or move into an active session. I already have one open, so you can also see how responsive it is or, well, somewhat responsive today. <laughs> and the entire thing runs in a Kubernetes cluster remotely. So uh, for every user, it provisions a dedicated user space. Right. Then uh, apart from collaboration and working with others, we also need to develop uh, technical projects and demonstrators at a really high pace. Um, because we cannot always do simulation or uh, analysis, and sometimes we need to go into physical prototypes. Um, the pace in projects is really fast, so there is no time really for classical paper flow. Um, also, the system design teams are usually very small in, in these uh, projects compared to non MBC stakeholders. So it's a challenge to integrate non MBC stakeholders really quick. Um, and yet, when we go on public tracks, we need to be compliant with EU and national regulations. So, um, the system design needs to be done to a process. Uh, requirement, requirements must be managed, identified, and be valid. Um, need to have evidence that our solution satisfies the requirements. And uh, most importantly, that the resulting system will do no harm. So. As an example of one of those uh, projects, um, we have sensors for rail, uh, and that's uh, where we also applied our tool chain. Um, so it's a project that demonstrates some um, 
key perception functionalities like landmark based localization, um, detection of trains and pedestrians, track detection, consolidation of multiple localization sources, and occupancy detection. And uh, the thing is designed in Capella, um, or at least architected in Capella, change controlled in Jira. It's a reasonable model in terms of number of commits and uh, release tags. We didn't use Team for Capella for this kind of project because we had a need to uh, somewhat approve changes before they get merged into the uh, main branch. And out of this model, we produce about 90 CI CD artifacts. Um, yeah, if you like, you can also learn more about the project here by following that link. So, what kind of artifacts we can produce? I mean, not on this project, but across multiple projects, we have multiple uh, different uh, pipelines. So, yeah, um, in this model centric engineering environment, where you are basically able to have less people on the systems engineering team. Um, because the model is in the, in the center of the project life and um, artifacts that concern non-MBC stakeholders, they get generated from the model uh, continuously. And um, our environment guarantees consistency across all these artifacts. So it takes quite some workload of the people. Um, this is how it works. Uh, we have the model repository where the project team works and uh, evolves problem and solution models. And we have the kind of configuration and templates repository where the tooling team helps us to maintain the uh, transformations, templates, and automation configurations. And every time we have a new uh, commit merged or pushed into the uh, main branch, uh, generation pipeline triggers, and it produces a number of confluence pages that people, people can review and get notified of. Documents and spreadsheets, uh, RecIF export since uh, recently. Um, some model to model transformations like Simulink or some other things. Um, Ideal, where data models are sufficiently good, we also do ROS or protobuf ideal transformations. And of course, model validation reports. So quite a few artifacts. Um, and that brings us to the, what is CI-CD in the MBC context? So yeah, CI-CD on its own is a software development method for well, that enables people to frequently integrate and deliver software to end users, right? And um, uh, when you try to apply this to MBC, well, it's basically the same. It's uh, a method to uh, get model together and make sure it's valid, run it through the quality gates, and then uh, build artifacts out of it. So the way we found it useful to apply this practice is the following. We first apply model modifiers. Um, you may have noticed while doing MBC work that there are quite a few repetitive tasks that an engineer would do if machine wasn't there. So that's exactly what we call model modifiers. Take away repetitive tasks from people. Um, then there is a checking stage to make sure that your model is healthy enough uh, to go on. So basic rule checking, consistency checking, uh, kind of are we modeling to the right uh, rules and uh, is it all ticking the box? And finally, we come to build and deliver artifacts. Um, yeah, now we can go into a few examples of uh, pipeline elements that I'm able to share with you. Uh, first, very basic one, model modifier for unique identification of key elements. You may have noticed that it's sometimes useful to refer to people uh, or in conversations to some model elements, um, not by name, but by ID, because you know, by name may take some time to find it in the model and there also might be duplicates. So we introduced uh, a feature that uniquely identifies um, model elements and gives them a human-friendly identifier and kind of keeps it 
save and then check. We use PVMT to um, inject that data into the model uh, or Rekif identifier in case of requirements. So this is um, generated by CICD. And that, another very basic modifier is change status assessment. Um, also, you may not want to trust humans to do that. Uh, so basically, when um, you have a model that was already released and you have a new model that is about to be released, you may want to compute change status for elements and requirements if uh, they have changed. And this is what we do. And um, when this happens, we also create a dedicated commit to that. It all happens automatically. You see the commit is offered by our SAT bot. Uh, some time ago. Uh, it has a summary for um, modification with reference to the baseline, to the last uh, model baseline. Um, then we have a pretty cool new modifier. It's uh, there since maybe a month, code requirement bot. And it's a bit of a beast. Unfortunately, I don't have a um, business agnostic example for it yet uh, around, but you can get a feeling for what it is about. Uh, so basically, while modeling, we realize that there are modeling patterns uh, that you can also ex express in natural language you know, or in the form of a formal requirement. And uh, what we tried to look into, and I think we found a solution for that, is how to tell the machine how to spell out the model such that um, it's able to generate natural language that you can take into uh, validation and verification lifecycle. Uh, most importantly, these uh, natural language elements are also lifecycle managed. So um, at the core of it, you see here is the um, pattern <laughs> requirement pattern instance definition. Uh, at the core of it, there is the uh, derived from element sequence, so basically references to model elements that allow this requirement to exist. And when any of those elements changes, the requirement is changed. And if any of those elements is destroyed, um, requirement is also destroyed. A uh, most simple example is function to component allocation. So you can spell this out as the component shall do function, uh, not a great requirement, but sometimes helps people to tick the box. Um, so if you change the location from one component to another, then, um, well, this requirement uh, will get destroyed and the new one will be created. Um, right. So this thing helps us to spell out the model and write by hand less requirements, significantly less requirements. We're also expanding this now to cover state machines and uh, basically describe state machines in natural language requirements. Um, yeah, and then we come to artifact generation. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with uh, M2Doc. It's a very nice thing, but uh, it was a bit too limited for what we wanted to do. And yeah, people also struggle a bit with templating there. So one of our team members, um, had an interesting idea and he came back with a proof of concept about a week, uh, some years ago. And he showed how we can use a uh, very basic and popular open source uh, libraries from the Python community to generate uh, rich collection of artifacts out of Capella models, not only words or Excel spreadsheets, but well, basically anything. <laughs> So um, at the core of it, we have Python Ginger templates library. And basically anything like text, HTML, or markdown can act as a template. And we went further and we also integrated Confluence into that. So we are able to create templates in Confluence and then render those into Confluence pages. And here are a few examples of how that um, Templating looks like it's, it's really simple. And I have a tiny demo. Um, have a bit of time. 
So let me just zoom in a bit since the quality isn't so great. Um, yeah, so this is how it looks like. Uh, templates um, are provisioned by environment with the model instance. There, there is a configuration for it. You can tell it what model, what version of model, what model version it shall be compared to if you have change control elements in it. Um, and then you're able to talk to it with very basic expressions like going through the list of entities is as easy as model.way.all entities and then for entity and entities fill the first column with entity name and the second one with entity description. Uh, but of course you can do much more complex uh, stuff with it and also go into uh, environmental parameters, which enable us to use the same template to generate specs for multiple components uh, or subsystems or physical parts or whatever. Um, and we have a preview up for that, but I wouldn't go there now because, um, yeah, this will take some time to run. Um, so when you have templates and your templates are building okay, um, of course, you need some maintenance efforts because things may change and uh, also project wishes may change as you go on. Um, but when it works, nothing stops you from wiring things together so that continuity uh, in delivery appears. And uh, since we use GitLab, we were able to really easily use GitLab CI. We had to, like, when we were building one or two artifacts, it was pretty easy and we had no need to, yeah, really manage things seriously. But when we came to a collection of about 90 artifacts, we had to introduce a build plan uh, for the project that basically prescribes what documents or technical things we want to build, uh, what delivery channels there are. For example, there are continuous preview channels, like if you change the main branch model, then you should see changes right after you change something and everybody else should see the changes in the staging area. But when the project has one of these release moments and you click the button and then release happens or staging of things for pre-release review. Um, so this is pretty much automated for us by this build plan um, where we are able to assign reviewers, assign roles, uh, wire up targets for delivery. And then on every commit or on release trigger, the build happens and delivers spreadsheets, PDFs, confluence pages, and some idle files. Um, but all of this would be impossible without um, being able to talk to the model. So I, I think a few other people also <laughs> expressed this uh, wish to, to be able to talk to the model. Um, and we also had this need, so we found a way to talk to the model outside of Capella without any Java on the way. Um, I'm very happy to share with you that we have this Jupyter Notebooks um, integration. Well, basically it's Jupyter Notebooks with Python, nothing else really. Uh, and a tiny little library that allows you to load Capella models from file system or from Git repositories and work with them in a headless mode. So here comes a quick demo. Um, yeah, so here we have a model. This model is in a file system and I can load it just like that. But uh, I have another model here that lives on Git and to load it, I just need to, well, specify the token, access token in this case and the Git path. And uh, this particular example is about change assessment. So I'm loading a model version and another model version and diffing them together. Uh, but back to the simple one. So things like getting actors list out of the LA is as simple as that, just model.la.all actors. You can also zoom in into actor of interest by name, just uh, filtering the, uh, the all actors list by name of the feature or by unique identifier. If you know the unique identifier, names do change all the time or frequently. And then you get the object summary here. 
And if you like to get some Excel spreadsheets, because uh, people in engineering love Excel spreadsheets, um, it's as easy as loading pandas data frames uh, library, another pretty famous Python thing. And there we go, that's a table. Functions allocated to actors, simple as that. And of course I can easily add more columns here. Let's say actor description. And maybe if I hit tab, it will also give me the autocomplete so I can see what else I can ask the actor about. Oh yeah, there is description. Um, yeah, in theory that should do. And there we go, there is description. It's a bit html -y, but that's very fine. And this command here, I can dump it to Excel. And now we see there is Excel file in the file system. Made a few seconds ago. Um, yeah, we have a few other interesting vehicles there to get to the elements. You can use um, X-type search. So basically search element by class name and find all elements of this type. Um, and of course you can spell out model in natural language using these things. So there is a bit more complex example. We iterate through all functional exchanges in uh, LA, a logical architecture layer. And we get source function, we get target function of this exchange. And then we basically spell out actor shall do function so that another actor could do the dependent function. Very simple way to turn model into text for those who like reading text. Um, the library also allows you to work with diagrams. So you can find diagrams. You can see programmatically what's on the diagrams. So basically uh, read diagrams with code. So filter out all components or parts or actors or functions. And we also have our um, Python-based visualization engine, which um, turns diagrams into um, SVGs, renders SVGs. Um, this engine is still a bit of a work in progress. So internally, we, um, for most things, use Capella diagrams. We have a diagram server around Capella, which exports Capella diagrams and injects them into the uh, this thing. Um, but the coverage of the diagramming engine also grows pretty fast. So anything XD, uh, um, yeah, data flow uh, of data flow nature or architecture blanks, you can do this engine already. Uh, class diagrams you can do as well, and state machines. Sequence diagrams are not working great yet. And uh, it doesn't need to be SVG all the time. You can also render it as uh, base64 encoded for, well, whatever is your target format. And PNG, of course. Um, yeah, and we thought this thing might be useful for more people than just uh, us internally. So we actually made it open source public. You can uh, well, find it right here. Uh, there is quite some documentation. Well, quite some. We're improving it. There is generated documentation. Um, where we talk a bit about how the API works, how the um, this idea of layers and cross layers, like basically system function and logical function, physical function are pretty much the same because they come from functional analysis package and inherit from abstract function. So all of them can be available in states of a state machine, uh, things like that. But there is also the uh, complete generated API documentation here where you can go into uh, layers. The thing also supports out of the box PVMT and Recif extensions. So it's pretty easy to work with. And uh, another colleague yesterday added another nice feature that now you can basically hit this play in binder button and have an instance of uh, the sample model running like, really on demand uh, for you to play with. So apart from that, uh, what you see on GitHub, um, yeah, well, provisioning takes some time, so I wouldn't probably go there. Uh, all right. 
So apart from the stuff that's already on GitHub, there are some uh, features that we're still uh, not sure if we want to release or not, but at least we can tease them. Um, some of that is dynamic diagramming. So for example, we found that for documents, um, it's really useful. You also see an example here in this tiny little preview. Difficult to see though. Um, yeah, people may not have time to draw this kind of context diagrams for a component or a function, but uh, in documentation, they are actually pretty handy. So there is some magic behind that that's able to generate those on the fly. And hope we can push it out soon. Um, yeah, that's roughly it. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope it wasn't too boring. Um, there are a few links here. If you'd like to get in touch or play with this stuff I made, feel free to go to that link here. All of these tools are fascinating. Uh, uh, first, did you spend a lot of time to implement them compared to the benefits you've ripped uh, for the use? Uh, and second, um, how many projects did it take to, to break even? Well, uh, to be honest, the effort was actually not so huge. Uh, the core team behind that is mostly made of, well, was mostly made of students for maybe a year and a half and got some full timers just about recently, like half a year, half a year ago. Um, and yeah, because we mostly use open source and uh, modern tech, it just, yeah, happens to click in together and work out of the box in most of the cases. Um, so yeah, breaking even, I mean, um, we started first automating around the reference architecture, but when the project started, the demand was really high for getting things out of the door fast. So we looked into that and saw some opportunities and yeah, I think, or maybe, maybe the first specs in the project were handwritten, but uh, for the second iteration, a few months, they were already somewhat, somewhat generated. And uh, yeah, in about a year, we got to 90 artifacts. So you create and manage requirements in Capella and export them as a REC IF. Uh, how do you do that? Well, um, in this thing, you can say, objects dot requirements, and then you have requirements. Uh, Capella natively stores requirements in a shape and form that's very similar to RecIF, so it's not a big uh, effort to get it out. You can try it yourself in Jupyter. Um, really easy. We plan to introduce a helper function as well that will basically allow you to dump entire module uh, to RecIF. For now, there is a bit of a uh, script around that, but it will get a bit more user-friendly. How do you interface with uh, size ML models? Model to model transformations. Uh, we had another team um, a bit more external to us that used uh, Eclipse Epsilon engine to do a uh, transformation from Capella to BTC integrity modeler format. It, it was a bit of a beast, uh, but at the end it worked out. <laughs> okay. And since then no one looked again at it. <laughs> Okay, do you generate ideal specs from a Capella model? And if so, oh, and what ideal? Uh, right, so we, we looked at two forms. We looked at uh, protobuf, and we also looked at uh, ROS2 ideal. Uh, the reason is we have quite a few um, projects that work with those two formats, ROS, or with those two ecosystems. Well, protobuf is format maybe, but uh, ROS2 is rather ecosystem. And um, yeah, when when the model the model of your data structures is good enough, um, there is no excuse not to do that. It's model to text transformation, so it's really um, straightforward. If you do the class diagram that describes your data structure well enough, then explaining to the engine how to transform that uh, in idle form is not a big deal. I think is your initiative harmonized or coordinated with uh, you initiatives such as a shift for, to rail? Um, I wonder if it refers to DSD as such, or if DSD, then yes, definitely. It's, uh, we have connections to shift to rail, and we were also releasing some early specs made with Capella to shift to rail uh, um, a repository some time ago. I think we got disconnected at a certain point, or 
Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> okay. There are quite a few uh, initiatives where we are present. Have you looked into OSSC-based interoperability for your MBSC and perhaps PLM ecosystem? Uh, yes, we considered that. And also some of our partners uh, actually looked into OSLC of Capella with this uh, publication for Capella, I think. Um, yeah, but we didn't go into that yet. So it's still on our roadmap to look where we have reason to go OSLC. It's a nice idea, but the solutions around are not very convincing, let's say. Have you used Python for Capella, available in labs for Capella for the development of those tools? Yes, we know about it and we looked into that. It actually happened a bit uh, later. So I think our PyCapel MBC was there first, uh, as it started about two and a half years ago, well, or two years ago, something like that. Um, but uh, Python 4 Capella was fast and going public. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there, there are two um, fundamental differences, though. Uh, Python 4 Capella builds around or requires Java and Capella and a few other things to work together. So the ecosystem behind it is pretty difficult, um, especially if you want to run a CI CD in uh, Linux containers and at a good speed. Um, yeah, and there was something else. Oh, something about Python versions. <laughs> Our stuff works with Python 3.8, and we currently also build against Python 3.10, which brings some great performance improvements and also uh, comfort of development. Uh, last time we looked into Python for Capella, it was still talking Python 2.7. I think that's maybe already changed, right?